Welcome. In this video, I'm going to talk about pH regulation of the stomach and some of the issues people have with their stomach and how medications can help with those issues. So this is from section 15.4. So the body must keep tight control over pH in cells and the extracellular fluid because changes in pH can have a huge effect on the activity of molecules, especially enzymes. The digestive tract, or gut is what it's referred to, generates and maintains several different pHs along its length to control the activity of digestive enzymes. And the stomach is unusual in that it can generate a pH as low as 1 to do 2 by producing and releasing HCl. Stomach acid is released from specialized cells called parietal cells, and the acid aids in digestion and kills off bacteria that may have been ingested with your food. But alcohol, smoking, caffeine, stress, and some drugs can cause excess production of stomach acid or gastric juice, and that's when people generally have issues. So excess gastric juices can lead to several problems. Acid indigestion, which is like when you have an upset or kind of a funky stomach. Heartburn, or what's also known as acid reflux or GERT, where the acid rises up into the esophagus and causes damage over time or an ulcer which damages the stomach lining. Dyspepsia is a term to describe all three of these issues in the upper abdomen. It's now known that microorganisms, such as this specific kind of bacteria, can also cause stomach ulcers, so sometimes treatment involves both antibiotics and something for the excess stomach acid as well. But when we're looking at relieving symptoms, we should also be looking at preventing the excess production of stomach acid. And there's two main types of drugs that do just that. Again, stomach acid is released from the linings of its walls, and it's done in response to stretching or distension of the stomach well, wall, as well as the presence of food. And several transmitters or chemical messengers, what we usually think of as hormones, are involved in signaling that it's time to produce the HCL and then to release it. And histamines are part of that system. They interact with the parietal cells to start the release of stomach acid, while the gastric proton pump enzyme exchanges H plus, the acid ions, for K plus ions to move the stomach acid from the lining into the stomach itself. So this means if you want to prevent excess stomach acid, you could either interfere with the histamines or you could interfere with the gastric, pro gastric proton pump, and either one could be effective. So let's look first at the histamine. H2 is um, an abbreviation for the histamine receptors, and it has nothing to do with hydrogen. It's unfortunate they use the same symbol, but here H2 has a totally different um, connotation or meaning. It's the histamine receptors in the parietal cells which receive the signal from histamine to start producing stomach acid. But the histamine can be blocked if a drug binds with the H2 receptor cells first. So this group of drugs is known as H2 receptor antagonists. Antagonists meaning that they're interfering with that job of binding with the histamine. And the most common H2 receptor antagonist is the brand name Zantac, or generically it's called ranitidin. And it's available over the counter, or if you need a stronger dose, it's also available by prescription. But this has been on the market quite a while, considered quite a safe drug, and used by a number of people who have ongoing um, dyspepsia. The proton pump inhibitors are a little newer. This is a drug that inhibits or prevents the proton pump from functioning, so it'll prevent the stomach acid from being released. So the H2 receptor antagonist prevent the signal from going out to make the HCL, whereas this is going to prevent it from releasing it. And two similar drugs do this. The first one, the Prilosec, Omeprazole, was developed first, and the Nexium is a slight adjustment, a slight tweak on that molecule, as you'll see, and marketed as a separate drug. And they are two of the world's most widely used medications right behind aspirin. And looking at the structure of each drug, you would not probably see a difference because they're what are called optical isomers, meaning they have the exact same structure, but it's arranged slightly differently in space or spatially. So Zantac, Prilosec, and Nexium are all preventative medications that need to be taken before eating for them to work, before the signal is given. So these three drugs are typically used for people with chronic indigestion or GERD, this acid reflux, 
But antacids are weak bases used to neutralize gastric juice after it's produced and released into the stomach. So this is more commonly used by somebody who doesn't have stomach trouble real often. They just overate this time or ate something that's not agreeing with them. So they use it just occasionally. So they're used for a wide variety of nonspecific digestive disorders. They're over-the-counter. They're very safe for occasional use. But no one should be taking them for a long period of time, partly because they change the pH of the stomach, which can alter other functions and actions of other drugs. So how do antacids work? Well, they're usually a metal hydroxide, like calcium, magnesium, or aluminum hydroxide. You're not going to see any of the strong hydroxides. Remember, bulink, barium, lithium, sodium, and potassium. Those hydroxides won't be used because they would be much too strong for our stomachs to tolerate. Often, actually, what's used is a combination of magnesium and aluminum because magnesium hydroxide acts quicker but also acts as a laxative, while aluminum hydroxide is slower to act but longer lasting and can relieve constipation. So the side effects kind of balance out and you cover a long time frame with having both the quick and slower acting relief in there. You'll notice when you look at the balanced equations for each of them that aluminum can oxid or can um, neutralize three moles of HCl for each mole of aluminum hydroxide, whereas magnesium is in a two to one ratio. Calcium would also be in a two to one ratio, so aluminum is slightly more effective mole for mole. Other antacids contain carbonate or hydrogen carbonate, usually sodium carbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate, and they're going to produce CO2 when they neutralize the acid, as you can see in the reactions below. And sometimes that gas can be a problem. So oftentimes they contain an anti-foaming agent, something called dimethicone, to help eliminate the gas. And if reflux is a problem, they may also contain what's called an alginate to make it float on top of the stomach. And then it acts like a raft or a barrier to the esophagus so that if anything gets refluxed up the esophagus, it will be this barrier, this um, hydrogen carbonate or just plain old carbonate. The word buffering was used when talking about aspirin. Remember, the buffering helped um, protect the stomach lining from the acid. And buffering means resistant to changes in pH with small additions of acid or base. So like the salt water tank in my classroom has a built-in buffering system that has to be maintained because depending on how much waste the fish are putting out or how much food doesn't get digested, that's going to affect pH level in there. And we don't want the whole uh, pH of the water changing dramatically or that would have a very negative effect on the fish. So buffering systems consist of a weak acid and its salt. So the weak acid is re represented as HA. H indicating it's an acid, and then MA representing the salt, a metal attached to it. And we can assume the acid is so weak that virtually none of it dissociates, while at the same time we can assume the ionic salts will completely dissociate. So using those two assumptions, that one, correct, one uh, reaction is not proceeding at all, the equilibrium is totally to the left, the other one is a complete reaction with the equilibrium totally to the right, They've come up with this equation, the henderson hasselbalch equation, to determine the pH of a buffer. So if you know the Ka or Kb value plus the initial concentration, the acid or base, and its salt, you can calculate the pH of your buffer. So this equation can look a little overwhelming, but it's really not that difficult. You take the pKa, so the negative log of whatever the Ka value is, and if I look up ethanoic acid, this will be in your data booklet, it has a Ka value of 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth at 298 Kelvin, that's why temperature was given. So I could take the negative log of 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, plus I need to find the log, not the negative log, just the log, of my two concentrations. Well, in this one, because I have 25 centimeters at 0.1 molar and 25 centimeters at 0.1 molar, these are going to be the same. I can go ahead and change this to 0.025 liters times 0.1 and find the actual value here, but I already know that 
I'm going to have the same concentration for both of these. So I could just sub in one over one, or if I want to go ahead and just have the practice of working it out, this is 0 0.0025 over 0 0.0025. So really, it's the log of one that I'm finding. And if I go ahead and uh, find those two values, I'm going to pause here and punch this into my calculator. I'm coming up with a pH of 4.74. So when I'd make this buffer solution, that's what I could expect for the pH. The second question asks, how much 0.1 molar per liter butanoic acid solution? So there's my concentration. Volume is what I'm wondering about. And solid potassium butanoate should be used to make 1 liter of pH 5.0 buffer solution. So now I know the pH is 5. I can find the pKa of, let me just put log there, for butanoic acid by looking it up. So I'm going to find the negative log of, and I'll look this up in my data booklet. And I see that it's actually giving me the pKa value, so I don't need to find the negative log, I can plug in pKa directly of 4.83, plus then I need to set up the log of my concentration of salt over my concentration of the acid. So it's the acid that I don't know, the salt I've been told is going to be 0.1, if I can uh, write this correctly, 0.1 here. So I just have to go ahead and solve for x here. So I could go ahead and subtract 4.83 from each side, leaving 0.17 is going to be equal to the log of x over 0.1. And now if I find, uh, I can take 10 to the 0.17 should be equal to x over 0.1 if I undo that log, or sometimes I call it the anti-log. And then I can go ahead and find x equal to 0.1 times 10 to the 0.17. And I get x equal to 0.15. And that's my moles per decimeter cubed for my concentration of the potassium butanoate.